Well, it's another day in the life of Israel in the wilderness. You wake up in your family tent, uh, the one you've been camping in for years now. And as you go outside, you look up and you see the pillar of smoke filling the tabernacle. God is in his tent too and dwelling in the midst of his people. And today you've planned as a family to go and visit him and to make what is called a peace offering. So you, to prepare, you go out back to your flock uh, and you find the best lamb that you could find. Uh, you carefully check over it to see whether there's any blemishes on it. Uh, and once you've chosen your lamb, you set off for the tabernacle for a sacrifice. As you're on your way, you spot other Israelites doing the same thing. Some have goats, some have oxen, but everyone's off to the same place, to the center of the camp where God is. When you get there, it's not long until it's your turn to make an offering. The priest calls you up, and so you and your family go into the courtyard of the tabernacle, and you take your lamb to the door of the tent of meeting, and you place your hands symbolically on its head, and then, and the sheep is dead. The priests come uh, to collect the body. Some drain it of its blood, uh, so they might pour it over the altar whilst others cut the sheep up, taking the fatty parts ready for the offering. And then from what's left of the animal, uh, the priest takes some of it for themselves, and then the rest of it is given to you to take home. Now everything is ready. The priests sprinkle the blood on the altar. The fat is placed on top. And then, as you stand face to face with God, the Lord, uh, the, the offering is consumed. The smoke rises from the offering as it burns everything up. And as you reflect there face to face with God, you cherish the peace that you have with him. The offering is a sweet smelling aroma to the Lord. And so you praise him for all of his mercy towards you. Well, when it's all over, you return to your tent to prepare dinner and lambs on the menu tonight. So, what's going on here then? Perhaps as the word of God was just read this evening, you felt clueless to what it was really all about. It might as well have been in the original Hebrew. (laughs) This passage, along with many others in Leviticus, are often difficult for us to understand Uh, For one, everyday life in Israel is nothing like it is here in Counterstorp. All of this talk of sacrifice sounds very gruesome. Lots of blood and chopping up fat. Uh, What does it all mean? Uh, But then, if we're honest, these passages can also be quite boring to read. Uh, Just take the first seven chapters of Leviticus. Offering after offering, uh, animal after animal, It sounds more like an instruction manual than a story. It's not exactly a bestseller. So we're left wondering, what does any of this even have to do with my life? What relevance does this have to us today? As 21st century Christians, we can find the Bible difficult to relate to at times. However, all scripture is profitable for us. And in fact, God has invested this part of his word with great significance. The portions of Leviticus that we're looking at tonight have some wonderful themes that we can apply to our lives. You see, sometimes passages in the Bible are just like eager to share their riches with us. Uh, They jump straight off the page. But then at other times, the gems require a bit more hard work to find. Leviticus certainly seems like one of those books which is hiding its gems from us. But all the hard work is worth it in the end. And so tonight we're going to look at the significance of the peace offering, which we've just looked at. And and as we learn about this old covenant offering, we will see that we can have fellowship with our God. Fellowship with our God. We have three points to look at this evening. Um, The first is going to be an overview of Leviticus chapter 3 and 7. The second point is going to then see its fulfillment in the New Testament. 
Uh, and then our final point, we'll look at some application. So let's come to our first point for this evening. A meal at the tabernacle. A meal at the tabernacle. At this point, you might want to have your Bibles open and have Leviticus 3 and 7 back open. We're going to flick between the two um, a few times. So, first things first. What are all these offerings about in Leviticus? Well, in a very basic sense, an offering is a gift for God. In chapters 1 to 7, of the, there are five main uh, offerings um, that Israel were prescribed to give. Two of these offerings were ways of giving thanks to God, and the other three were ways of making atonement for sin. And so there were thanksgiving offerings and atonement offerings, ways to say thank you to God and ways of saying sorry for sin. Now, we're, tonight we're focusing on one of the thanksgiving offerings, which is the peace offering. But it's not as the name would suggest. Perhaps we might think of peace offerings kind of a way of negotiating peace. Uh, peace talks are common today. Uh, there's so much war going on in our world, and so diplomats are constantly trying to offer solutions um, to solve and make peace. Well, the peace offerings in the Old Covenant didn't function in that way. Uh, that's what the atonement offerings were for. The atonement offerings were a way of making up for our sin. But the peace offerings were a way of expressing that peace that was already there between God and the people. It was a way of saying thank you to God for the peace that they already had with him. So the peace offering was a way for Israel to enjoy the peaceful relationship they had with the Lord. And Leviticus 7 tells us of three occasions when a peace offering could be made. Um, so let's have a look at Levit Leviticus 7. So firstly, in chapter 7 and verse 12, we read that a peace offering could be a thanksgiving offering. This offering was prescribed to be given on special occasions throughout Israel's history. So for instance, um, they might be offered at festivals or after a momentous occasion. Uh, Joshua offered a peace offering when, he ent when, when Israel entered the land of Canaan. Uh, and David offered a peace offering uh, when the ark entered Jerusalem. There were, these were times of great celebration and thanksgiving for God's covenant mercies to his people. Secondly, then, in, chap in chapter 7, verse 16, we read that a peace offering could be a vow offering. Perhaps an Israelite would make a vow um, and to make an offering uh, in response to answered prayer. A good example of this was the case of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Uh, Hannah made a vow to make an offering to God if he gave her a son. And so when God gave her Samuel, uh, Hannah fulfilled her vow and offered a peace offering. Again, this was in thankfulness to God for his grace. And then thirdly, in chapter 7, verse 16, it also says a peace offering could be given as a free will offering. Uh, meaning that a peace offering could be given at any time voluntarily by the offerer for any reason they wished uh, wanted to give thanks for. Uh, perhaps they wanted to give thanks to God for his covenant mercies um, new every day. Uh, for maybe offering, thanking that he is in relationship with them. So, there were two main kinds of offerings in Israel. Thanksgiving and atonement. Ways of saying thank you to God ways of saying sorry to God. And then one of the ways of saying thank you could be a peace offering, uh, given either on a special occasion uh, or in fulfillment of a vow or freely as an expression of praise. Now, what's interesting about the peace offerings is that the Israelites would eat part of the offering themselves. That all the other offerings were consumed on the altar. But the peace offering was split into multiple parts. Part of the offering was for God, part, another part was eaten by the priests, and another part was left, everything that was left over was eaten by the offerer. So, what does that all mean? Well, God would be in his tabernacle. He would be on one side of the altar, and then the altar would be sitting in the middle of them, and then the offerers and the priests would come on the other side of the altar. 
And so here, God in his tent would meet face to face with his people as they came to visit him. And there in the middle was like a table set up. This is a place where God's food would be placed on the offering. And then God would consume his food on the altar and the Israelites would eat the rest. Making the peace offering a symbolic meal between God and his people. Now, the reason we have two passages this evening is because they both give instructions for the meal. Chapter 3 speaks of God's part of the meal, and chapter 7 speaks of Israel's part, split between the priests and the people. And so we're to imagine a meal here, a very strange meal, but a meal nonetheless. Let's have a look at chapter 3 then and see God's part of the meal. Please turn back to chapter 3. Uh, This chapter neatly divides into three sections, describing three instructions for three different animals that could be offered. So verses 1 to 5 are about cattle and herds, verses 6 to 11 are about sheep, and verses 12 to 16 are about goats. The instructions as we went through were very similar. There are very similar things being offered, um, but there was some um, differences. Uh, So... Uh, the animal could be male or female, um, unlike other, other offerings that always had to be male. It also says that only the oxen and the sheep had to be without blemish. And then there's no mention of age uh, anywhere here, unlike some of the other offerings um, that had to be young. So once the animal was chosen from one of these three animals, it would be taken to the tabernacle to present before the Lord. The offerer would lay their hands upon the goat, identifying themselves with the offering, and then the animal would be killed. Its blood was taken by the sons of Aaron and sprinkled all over the altar. And then the fat was also taken from the animal and placed on the altar. Then the priests would burn the food on the altar. And the fat here being offered is the richest part of the animal. And so the richest part was offered to God. And so this was a symbolic act of bur- when they burnt the fat, a symbolic way of saying that God had eaten his part of the meal. Now, God did not literally eat the fat on the altar. For one, God is spirit. Uh, he does not have a body, uh, so he doesn't have a mouth uh, to eat with or a stomach to fill. Uh, but then more importantly, God does not depend on food as we do. He's the one who made the food. In fact, food depends on God. And so this offering here was not to say God is coming to actually needs this food here or even needs this offering. It's a symbolic way of saying that God has fellowship with his people. And the Lord was pleased with this. In verse 5, it says that the food offering had a pleasing aroma to the Lord. God not only accepted the offering, but also the one who had offered it. Here is God at his table, the altar, accepting Israel into fellowship with him. So Leviticus 3 teaches us all about God's part in the meal. And now let's briefly turn back to Leviticus 7 to see what the Israelites were allowed to eat. Uh, So last time back to Leviticus chapter 7. So let's start with what the priests would eat. Verses 28 to 34 explain that the priests were allowed to eat the breast and the right thigh of the animal. And so those parts would be separated away and reserved for them later to eat. Verses 12 to 14 also say that if an Israelite offered a thanksgiving offering, they also had to bake bread and cakes for the priests as well. And so this was far than enough to feed them as they were devoted to this duty in the temple. This was far than enough provision for them and their families. Then um, that's the priest's offering. And so what did the offerer get? Well, they had basically everything else. Verses 15 to 18 explain different rules for eating. Uh, And so if they offered a Thanksgiving offering, they had to eat it uh, the remaining part that evening. Um, But if they had offered a vow or a free will offering, they had to save it to the next day. And that's it. That's the peace offering. In Leviticus 3, God gets his portion, 
In Leviticus 7, the priests get their portion, and also the offerer and his family gets their portion as well. The final verses then to mention are verses 19 to 27, which explain the consequences for unlawful eating. Because this was a meal with God, the Israelites couldn't just eat in any old manner. You know, if, if you're hosting a meal, you're the one who's in charge of the food. It's not for your guests to come rummaging around in your cupboards, uh, cooking up whatever they like. Uh, it's taken that you eat the food that's been given to you. And so the same was true with Israel. God told them that what, what animals to bring and how to eat them. And so if any Israelite brought anything not acceptable, or if any Israelite came in uncleanliness, then they were to be cut off from the people, which usually meant death. It sounds quite harsh to our ears, but this is a meal with a holy God that we're talking about. And so it was either fellowship with him on his terms or no fellowship at all. Wow, that's a lot of information to take in. Well, we've covered uh, most of the details. There's a few more little details in the chapters that we've just read that we haven't looked at. Um, but we can see the meal now. We can see what occurred. Let's take a breather and just recap the main points. The peace offering was all about two things. Thanksgiving to God and fellowship with God. Any Israelite who wanted to give thanks to God would meet with him at his temple. They were basically going to the temp for a meal with the Lord. And they would come on special occasions or in fulfillment with a vow or voluntarily just to say thanks for his grace. And then at the altar, God and his people would meet face to face. God would consume his part of the meal on the altar the priests would take their part, and then the offerers would go home with their part in the evening. All of this was a symbolic meal between God and his people, a symbol of peaceful fellowship and gratitude towards God. Okay, so who's ready to go to the tabernacle tomorrow morning then? Well, none of us are going to do that, are we? If you're a Christian here tonight, uh, you know that we don't make sacrifices anymore. But why not? It's a common objection to Christianity. Aren't you Christians just picking and choosing uh, what parts of the Bible to obey and what not to obey? Look at all these laws in Leviticus. Uh, sacrifice sheep, uh, don't eat pork, uh, don't wear mixed fabrics. Why aren't you keeping any of them? Why don't Christians follow the Old Testament laws today? Well, there is a big difference between the law in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Certain commands were only given to the Israelites under the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant being the old relationship between God and Israel. But the New Covenant is between God and his church. We live in a different covenant relationship than Israel. And so there are different commands. And so the old covenant commandments are not binding upon us today. But the same old covenant commandments have a new form in the new covenant. Now think of it like this. We're no longer to offer animals as thanksgiving offerings, but we're still to be thankful. And we're, not, we're still meant to meet with God, uh, but we no longer meet with him at the tabernacle or the temple for that matter. Thankfulness and fellowship are still aspects of our new covenant relationship with God, but they look different to that under the old covenant. And why do they look different? Well, it's all because of one man, Jesus Christ. So here's point two for this evening. A meal with Jesus. A meal with Jesus. Jesus. The whole purpose of the peace offering in the Old Covenant was to meet face to face with God. But in the New Covenant, we see God meeting face to face with his people in the person of Jesus Christ. We see this in John chapter 1 verse 14 when it says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word, the Son of God, purposely took a human nature to dwell with us. 
And in fact, the word there for dwelt there literally means that he tabernacled among us. With the coming of the new covenant, God came to meet with his people, not in a tent or a temple, but in the person of Jesus Christ. And how did Jesus meet with his people? He went out for meals. Jesus came to eat with us. Across the four gospel accounts, Jesus is explicitly said to have eaten 14 times. And that's excluded other recorded events where food would have been available. Jesus even describes himself as the son of man who came eating and drinking. So this is one reason why Jesus came, to eat and to have fellowship with us. Let me give you a few examples of this. So take Mark chapter 2 and verse 15. Now it happened, as he was dining in Levi's house, that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. Many tax collectors and sinners. Many people at Levi's house dining with the Lord. Then take John 12, verses 1 and 2. Then, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at table with him. There Lazarus was seated with Jesus, having supper with him. And then who can forget the account of Zacchaeus? This is what it says in Luke chapter 19, verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must come and stay at your house. Levi, Lazarus and Zacchaeus, tax collectors and sinners, Jesus met with them all. But this upset the religious leaders of the day, didn't it? Those who kept the law, those who offered peace offerings. This was their reaction in Mark 2, verse 16. When the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? They couldn't understand Jesus' behavior, could they? Uh, This is a teacher, a rabbi, a role model for all Jews. So why was he eating with tax collectors? Uh, What fellowship did he have with sinners? Those who weren't allowed to make peace offerings because of their sin? Well, it's all because Israel was undergoing a complete overhaul in their relationship with God. Under the old covenant, they took the meal to the tabernacle. But now the tabernacle came to them. Jesus came to eat with his people. But this still doesn't explain how he could come and visit them. How could he meet with sinners and tax collectors? Weren't they unclean? Weren't they not allowed to have fellowship with God? Well, Jesus answered the Pharisees in Mark 2 verse 17 with this. Those who are well and have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Here we see the beautiful heart of Jesus on display in all its glory. He came not for the healthy, but for the sick. Not for the clean, but the unclean. He came for the sinful, that they might be forgiven of their sins. He came for the lost, that they might be found. This is what all the offerings in the Old Testament were pointing to, both thanksgiving and atonement. It was pointing towards a day when God would come and dwell with his people. A day when Jesus would be the atonement offering. He would pay the price for our sin. But then also a day where Jesus would come and have fellowship with us and that we would thank him and praise him. Now is the day that we can meet with our God through Jesus Christ. Obviously, we can't meet with him face to face right now, but we can meet with him by faith. We can look and see him there in the gospel, held out to us, ready to meet with us, 
ready to cleanse us of our sins, ready to forgive us of our iniquities, and ready to have fellowship with us by his Spirit, day by day until his return. This is the good news for all of us this evening. Our biggest need this evening is to have fellowship with Jesus. Our greatest sin that we, is that we so often do not. We have, all have ungrateful hearts. Who, we've turned away from our creator. We've feasted ourselves upon our sinful pleasures. We have no appetite for God in ourselves. We, and instead, we crave and hunger after our own desires. Pride, greed, lust, the list goes on. If God would only let us see how corrupt we really are. And yet God also reveals how merciful he really is. Has the merciful Jesus met with you? The, the Jesus that was offered for you. The Jesus who came to kill your craving for sin. Now look to him on the cross. Look to him risen from the grave. Look to him who is now ascended on high, reigning in heaven today. He is ready to meet with you, to cleanse you of your sins, and to give you new life in him. This moves us on then to our final point for this evening. Uh, because we can have fellowship with Jesus. The purpose of the peace offering in the Old Testament was a way of saying thanks to God and for having fellowship with him. But now in the New Covenant, we can have fellowship with God through Jesus Christ day by day. And so our final point tonight will be three applications for us in our relationship with God. And so let's come to our final point now. Meals forevermore. Meals forevermore. Our first application then is this. May we cultivate thankfulness to God. May we cultivate thankfulness to God. We saw earlier that the peace offering was a way of saying thank you to God for his grace. And there were three reasons to give a peace offering, weren't there? Uh, thankfulness on special occasions, in fulfillment of a vow, uh, and as a free will offering too. We can give thanks to God for the same reasons, can't we? First of all, uh, we can give thanks to God on special occasions. We have many occasions in our lives and in the life of the church where we can express our thanks, can't we? You know, week by week we have the Lord's Day that we can come and praise him and glorify him. Uh, but then throughout the year we also have think, events like Easter and Christmas, uh, traditional times for us to be thankful to God for his son, Jesus Christ. But then we've just had a baptism this morning uh, and we can be thankful uh, for when God provides and saves. We can be thankful today of Daniel and his, the salvation in his life. We can also give thanks at weddings. We can give thanks when children are born. We can also give thanks at funerals. Times to grieve, yet also times to give thanks for the, God's work in individuals' lives. We have so many occasions to be thankful to God for, woven into our lives. So let's make use of them and give thanks to the Lord for all his grace towards us. But then secondly, we can also give thanks for answered prayer. We're not called to make vows anymore uh, for peace offerings like in the Old Testament, but we can still make our requests made known to God in prayer. We can pray for the lost to be saved, our family, our friends, our work colleagues. We can pray for those who are unwell, uh, those with a physical illness, psychological, or even spiritual. We can pray for those who are backslidden. We can pray for those uh, for having exams or job interviews, uh, for guidance in our lives, for stressful meetings with difficult people, for opportunities to share the gospel. We can pray against evil legislation in government, we can pray for the end of wars. We can pray against Satan's schemes um, that they might be thwarted and crushed. There is so much that we can be praying for. And so when God does answer prayer, we're to give thanks. At times it just comes spontaneously, doesn't it? Uh, we hear of some good news and we're overwhelmed with joy and thankfulness. But then more often than not, we find it difficult to be thankful. 
We can get so caught up in our present problems that we forget to thank God for helping us with our old ones. So perhaps it would be good to keep a prayer diary or, or to a list of unsaved people that we're praying for. But this is what C.S. Lewis did when he used to be, when he was praying for the lost. Here's a quote from him. I have two lists of names in my prayers for those, who's for, those for whose conversion I pray and those for whose conversion I give thanks. The little trickle of transferences from list A to B is of a great comfort. What a great idea to be praying for the unsaved, to have two lists, ones we're praying for, ones we're thankful for. Perhaps we can make similar lists for other things in our prayers, uh, in our prayer lives. But then thirdly, we can give thanks to God freely at any time. There doesn't need to be a special occasion or answer to prayer to praise God. We can give thanks all the time for his grace and mercies towards us. Jesus Christ has blessed us so richly that even eternity will not be enough to give him all the thanks and praise for all that he has done for us. Perhaps you learn something new about Christ and your status in him. Then give thanks. Give thanks for all he has done for you and all that he is for you. May we cultivate a response of thankfulness and praise to our God for all that he is doing in our lives through Jesus Christ. Secondly then, a second point of application. Let us cultivate a love for the Lord's Supper. Let us cultivate a love for the Lord's Supper. Under the old covenant, the peace offering was a symbolic way of a meal between the Lord and Israel. But then when God came uh, in Jesus, he ate with his people in person. The whole old covenant system became obsolete. But then Jesus instituted a new meal for the new covenant, the Lord's Supper. And now he calls us to have fellowship with him at his table. This is one way the sacrifices of the old covenant have now changed into the new. Instead of going to the altar uh, table at the tabernacle, we now come to the Lord's table as a place to have fellowship with Jesus. As we come twice a month, we're to be sorry for our sin, but also uh, to, and to cling to the atoning sacrifice of Christ. But then we're also to give thanks for all the blessings that are now ours in him. And so just as the offerer shared in the peace offering, may we share in the offering of Christ at the Lord's Supper. It's not that the bread or the wine transfer any blessings to us. There's nothing special in them. The bread and wine are merely symbolic of what we of Christ. But by faith then, as we come, we can receive a fresh sense of our forgiveness and confidence in God's promises. The Lord's Supper is a special time to have fellowship with the Lord, to meet with him at his table. And so let's love the Lord's Supper. Let's view it as a special meal twice a month, a special time set apart to meet with him. Uh, we had a church meal uh, earlier, didn't we? But do you realize your church already has two church meals each month, one on the first and one on the third Lord's Day? The Lord's Supper should be a date on our calendars, a time we prepare for. Let's be ready on those occasions, ready to confess remaining sin in our lives, but also ready to give thanks for the truths of the gospel and our union with Jesus. Let's correct any poor views of the Lord's Supper and let's come and long to meet with him at his table. When we come, let's relish in his sacrificial death for our sins and rejoice in all the blessings that are now ours in him. Finally then, our third and final point of application. May we cultivate a longing to eat with Jesus in glory. May we cultivate a longing to eat with Jesus in glory. This point flows uh, on from our previous point quite nicely. Because on the night that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper with his disciples, he promised to eat it again. Not here on earth, but at his return with the coming of the kingdom. That day is still to come, and it's a day we are longing for. It's the day the Bible calls the great marriage supper of the Lamb. The great climax of history will be a fellowship feast with Jesus Christ. 
There won't be any atonement offerings for sin, but only offerings of thanksgiving and praise. There at the heavenly feast, we will be seated at his table, seated face to face with Jesus, our God. And there we will share that everlasting meal with him. So let's long to be with Jesus on that day, to feast with Jesus in eternity. And may that longing overflow into our evangelism too. Uh, let us go out into Counterstorp and into Leicester with the gospel of the heavenly banquet feast. May we take the invitations to the wedding out, calling sinners to dine with Jesus. Let's warn about the consequences of rejection, to be cut off from fellowship with God. But let us show them their seat at the table their place amongst the people. And let's invite them to enter into the eternally blessed state of feasting with our God. This is where the peace offering was always leading to. We started in a very strange place, didn't we? Oxen, sheep, goats being sacrificed on an ancient Israelite altar. But we saw, didn't we, that but despite being a strange ritual to us, it was all about fellowship with God and being thankful to him. Then we saw the progression as it came through to the new covenant. Jesus came to do away with the need of animal sacrifices, as now we can come to have fellowship uh, through him. He offered himself as a sin offering, a covering for our sin. He came so that we might have peace with God, and he came so that we might enjoy that peace. Now we can offer sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving to God today. We can be thankful in so many ways to God for all his grace to us in Christ. We can enjoy special times of fellowship with him at the Lord's table, but then we can also long to meet with him face to face at the heavenly banquet feast. Will you be there? Have you accepted the invitation to the heavenly wedding? Will you be feasting with Jesus for all eternity? Or will you be sent away, cut off from God, to face the eternal judgment. There are no feasts in hell, no meal times. There's nothing to be thankful for, no fellowship with God at all, only eternal curses, eternal separation from the love of God left to face his eternal wrath forever and ever. Don't imagine you can get into the wedding feast without knowing Jesus Christ. We must come to him now, today, for it is a day of grace. We can meet with him today. We can have fellowship with him today, but it will last into eternity. He has offered himself for us in his, uh, through, uh, for our salvation, that we might have eternal life, that is to know him forever. And so leave your sins at the cross. Confess your cravings and selfish desires, and take the light in Christ the Saviour. When you know him, nothing else on earth will satisfy you any longer. Only Jesus. Look to him for your all in all, and look forward to meeting him at the heavenly banquet feast, which he will share with you for all eternity. Amen. <laughs>